This week on Brian Ross Investigates. COVID quackery crackdown. The feds move in to shut down a so-called church that claims it has a cure using bleach for COVID-19 and wanted President Trump's blessing. Mr. President, please, we just want the right to choose. But its self-proclaimed archbishop has been offering the same bleach concoction for years as a treatment for autism, cancer, and heart disease. Critics asking why it took so long to finally stop it. Plus, the 2020 election. Our long lines, fewer polling places, and mayhem ahead. One investigative reporter says Trump and the Republicans are already busy stealing the election. This is going to be a disaster come November unless we prepare. And this week's winners and losers in the media. See if you agree with the editors of Mediaite about their choices. We don't endorse those words. They have no connection to the show. From the Law and Crime Trial Network, this is Brian Ross Investigate. Good evening and thank you for joining us and welcome to our viewers on YouTube Live and Facebook Live. I'm joined tonight by my colleague at the Law and Crime Network, Rhonda Schwartz. And Rhonda, we begin with a crackdown on COVID-19 quackery. For years, a man by the name of Mark Grennan has been offering what he calls a miracle mineral solution that he says cures autism, cancer, heart disease, Alzheimer's, and most recently, COVID-19. In fact, authorities say it's nothing more than industrial bleach. But Grennan has been getting away with it, Rhonda, for years because he claims he's the archbishop of a church he founded, Genesis 2, and that he's protected by the First Amendment, distributing this cure as a kind of sacrament. That's right, Brian. And last April, the federal government ordered Mark Grennan and the Genesis Church to stop selling this so-called miracle cure, but they didn't stop. And last week, federal agents moved in to shut down, shut down their operation in Florida. It was a big raid. In fact, reporters covering it saw uh, federal agents taking away barrels full of chemicals. A Tampa area man and his three sons are facing federal charges this morning. They're accused of selling a counterfeit cure for the coronavirus and other diseases. The criminal complaint says the bleach-like mixture billed as Miracle Mineral Solution was sold nationwide through an outfit called the Genesis 2 Church of Healthy and Healing. Federal agents raided a Bradenton home that investigators say has been the distribution site for a potentially harmful solution called Genesis MMS. Marketed as a miracle treatment for coronavirus, four men, Mark Grennan and sons Jonathan, Jordan and Joseph, are accused of telling people to drink that solution, which turns into a powerful bleach that could be fatal. They were ordered to stop selling their toxic bleach solution, marketed as a coronavirus cure in April. Since then, the church has continued to sell the substance, even sending letters to the judge overseeing the case, saying they would not comply and threatening violence. Right now, 34-year-old Jonathan Grennan and 26-year-old Jordan Grennan are being held on a U.S. Marshal hold at the Pinellas County Jail. Jonathan and Jordan Grennan behind bars following their arrest on Wednesday in connection to the raid at their church. Thousands of pounds of evidence were confiscated. But the Archbishop himself, Mark Brennan, has fled the country. He's in Colombia, where this week he was interviewed by Mike Adams of Natural News, a very sympathetic interview, getting Grennan's view of what happened. Mark Grennan is currently in Colombia, and he expects to be arrested and extradited at any moment. He joins us now with an emergency message for health freedom. Mark, thank you for joining me today. Mike, I really appreciate you. Um, having us on today because it's very important for for all of us and for the world. Um, we uh, we're just going through it. We've been going through it for three months with these people, really ten years. But this is as of April eighth, they sent us a warning that we should stop um, based upon what the FDA says. We the FDA sent us the warning. We should stop giving our sacraments to the world. So, and we just basically said no. We have the first to write. First Amendment, which is, I was, it's right up here. <laughs> I don't know if you could see it too good, but it's right up there. It says we have the exercise, the free exercise of our religious beliefs. According to federal court documents, Granite made last year a half million dollars selling this industrial bleach as a cure for all these diseases. And it's been hardly a secret that for years he's been doing this. He's been the subject of a number of investigative reports, including one that Rhonda Schwartz and I did at 2020 of ABC News. 
Are you harming yeah. people, do you think, with this, sir? Yeah. You're not? Not, not at all. No. And you stand yeah, by no. that this can cure yes. all these diseases? We cure many things. And you honestly you believe this can cure cancer? You're an actor, okay? I'm a reporter. You're a piece of that they say in Spanish. But just, just, just leave. Go check we out the facts, okay? With our church service. I've asked You're, for you, live you interviews. Yes. And I've got the facts. You people are liars. So the question now for many critics of Mark Grennan and his uh, miracle cure is why did it take so long? We're joined by Fiona O'Leary from County Cork in Ireland, who for years has been trying to get the attention of authorities to crack down. Fiona, thank you for joining us. Now that he is a fugitive, do you think he's going to stop? No, I don't, um, because the Genesis 2 Church do not believe in the law and they do not follow the law. They think they're a church and that they don't have to answer to the law. And I really fear that Mark Graham won't be arrested um, like his sons have been and that he will hide out in Colombia where he's living, I believe, at the moment. And um, he's only one of many. I just want to make that clear. These arrests are important, but there are hundreds of people doing this as we speak, mostly um, in South America, especially in Ecuador, where his colleague Andreas Kalkar is uh, making this as a miracle cure for COVID as we speak. And there are thousands of people being experimented on with bleach as we speak. So this uh, scam continues to spread around the world. Uh, Fiona, according to court documents, it actually has caused death and made several people ill. Uh, what do you know about that? I'm aware of that for many years now. I've been campaigning against the Genesis 2 for seven years. I do this on a voluntary basis, and I am outraged at this stage because the FDA did know about the Grenons factory in Florida. They knew about this some years ago, and it didn't um, seem to push them to stop them when it came to giving this to autistic children. Let's make this clear, Brian, that autistic children have to drink this and they also have to suffer bleach enemas in a way to kind of cure their condition, which is not a disease. Autism is not a disease. It is a neurodevelopmental condition. So even the wording is appalling. So while I wel welcome what's happening at the moment, I just wish the FDA had done it sooner for autism. COVID is um, being kind of a green light to kind of tackle this quackery. But... Arresting the grounds is not enough. We have Karen Vera in Germany, who is apparently being investigated by the police, but she has not been arrested. She is one of the biggest players in the Genesis 2 cult in relation to bleaching autistic children. And then we have Andreas Kalper. My real concern right now is South America, Ecuador, mostly. There are 10 bishops of the Catholic Church advocating this as a cure for COVID as we speak. It's amazing what desperate people will believe. Fiona, a question for you from uh, Rhonda Schwartz. Rhonda? Fiona, you're talking about people taking this that they believe it might cure COVID. What is it that makes people so desperate to try this so-called miracle cure? What's the appeal? Well, I think that in uh, countries like in South America or in countries where scientific information isn't readily available, that people are naive. And I suppose if they have somebody that is plausible, like um, some members of this cult, they come across very scientific. They say they're doctors when they're not. They use bogus certificates to say, I'm a doctor, and they're not really doctors. And then now we have the Catholic Church and some representatives advocating it. They feel huge influence on vulnerable people. And if you don't have much money, you know, and if you can't get health care, this bleach isn't expensive, you know, it's like $30 to take. And Facebook, social media have been advocating this for so many years. There are so many groups on Facebook, even right now, that are posing this as a cure for COVID. Um, for autism, it's still there, but not as much because we've been so aggressive in trying to shut it down. But there's loads of groups and pages on Facebook right now saying that this bleach cures COVID-19. So people believe it. Mm. And this whole idea that he's formed a church and that these are the sacraments of the church and gives them a kind of protection, that's really just a fiction, isn't it? Well, it's crazy. I'm sorry. This has got nothing to do with religion or God. Um, they do this to circumvent the law, to not pay taxes. I mean, I was shocked, actually, Brian. I have received the court papers in the last week in relation to what they were making. And I was literally... Um, I don't know, I was very traumatized to see that they've made like nearly $130,000 last April 
selling bleach mostly to people with COVID-19. Can you imagine having COVID-19 and not being able to breathe, then have to even smell these chemicals and ingest them? It's, actually, it's, it's abuse and it's torture. And I'm outraged that there are doctors and you know representatives of the Catholic Church thinking that this is the right thing to give people who are already suffering so much. And finally, Fiona, we just have about 30 seconds left, but you have been the subject of much uh, harassment online, haven't you, for taking the stand against the church? It's been a nightmare. I mean, every day I get some kind of abuse in relation to this, um, even recently. Mark Brennan especially has been very aggressive towards me, calling me a witch, uh, B-I-T-C-H, um, you know, accusing me of being mentally ill. He's uh, said I am the child of a motherless goat. He uses quotations from the Bible to abuse me, but it doesn't bother me because I know what I'm doing is so important, especially for children. I've seen babies being given this bleach recently in groups on Facebook. I've seen breastfeeding mothers ingesting this to prevent COVID-19. I'm calling on the Pope, actually, to um, address his bishops to stop spreading this bleach um, scam. And I'm calling on Facebook to shut down all groups and pages to protect people from this horrendous bleach cult. Fiona Larry, thank you so much for joining us. Really appreciate it. Uh, we asked uh, Mark Grennan, the Archbishop, if he would appear on this program. He said he would never talk with me. All right. Coming up next, the election in this country is 16 weeks away, and some people claim it's already being stolen by the Republicans. See if you agree. You're watching the Law and Crime Trial Network. Just so you can win this election. Sir, please do not touch him. I'm not, I'm not touching him. Well, the November presidential election is now just 16 weeks away, and already in the primaries, we saw all sorts of chaos and mayhem, long lines, few polling places, few polling workers. And many say the worst is yet to come, including an investigative journalist who's written a provocative new book on the subject. Greg Palace, thank you so much for joining us tonight. I like the fedora. <laughs> thank you. I'll get you one. You your book is out today, How Trump Stole the 2020 Election. What's that all about? The election hasn't taken place yet. Uh, yeah, yeah, but it's already been stolen. The fix is in. But we can unfix it. We can bust the burglary. I don't want people to get dis despairing. I think that there's still a chance that the voters will choose the president instead of trickery. And uh, so, yeah, so that's the big problem. And when you say he's already stolen, what do you mean? Okay. When I say he, it's it's the uh, it's the vote thieving tricksters. In the past couple of years, we've had 16 million people purged. That is erased from the voter rolls. Most people don't know that they've lost their vote, and our experts have gone through these purge lists in in several states and found that about half are phony. We've had millions of people wrongly losing their right to vote. You can, by the way, reestablish your right to vote. Just go online and check your registration. I'm telling people about that because I don't want you to think it's gone and lost forever. No, no. You're still an American citizen. Please check your registration. But 16 million people have lost their vote. That's And unless they get it back, we already have a stolen election in swing states like Wisconsin. For example, in Wisconsin, they're trying to remove 152,000 voters, the uh, Republican legislature voted to remove these 152,000 voters on the grounds that they moved. You know, look, if you left Wisconsin, Brian, you shouldn't be voting in Wisconsin. If you left Milwaukee, you shouldn't vote in Milwaukee. But I went to Milwaukee, and I met with one of the people that was on the, the list of people who supposedly left Milwaukee, and I asked Saquana Taylor, have you left Milwaukee? And she said, I don't think so. I'm Milwaukee County supervisor. Yeah. But she is African-American woman. So the targeting has gone after young people and voters of color. And that's what I'm very, very concerned about. We can reverse this, but at the moment, the fix is in. You've done some great work on this. Let's take a look at a clip where you confronted then a Georgia Secretary of State, now Governor uh, Brian Kemp, about all of this. 
Uh, Mr. Kemp, are you removing black voters from the voter rolls just so you can win this election? Sir, please do not touch him. I'm not, I'm not touching him. Mr. Kemp, are you removing black voters just to win this election? Please don't touch me or I'll have you arrested. Please don't touch me. Sir, are you, why are you purging voters from the voter rolls? There's two Okay. Some decent okay. Okay. Sir, why aren't you answering my questions? Sir, why do we have to sue you to get the to get the names of voters who've been removed? And now, Greg, what's the status in Georgia? Well, the status in Georgia is the, that type of trickery. I actually had to sue that uh, that guy, Brian Kemp, to get the list of voters he wants to remove from the voter rolls. And we want a federal court case. Now we're going through that list and we're finding a third of a million voters were wrongly removed from the voter rolls in Georgia, including Martin Luther King's 92-year-old cousin, who they say had left Atlanta. She's been living in the same house for half a century since Martin Luther King uh, used to come over for Sunday dinner. This is what's happening all over America. So in Georgia is where they took the kind of system of removing voters from the voter rolls out for a test drive. It works so well that they've taken it to Ohio and Michigan, and they're trying to bring it into Wisconsin and several other states. And that's what I'm worried about. This is a mass attack on the voter rolls. That's just one of the little tricks that they can pull. And I'm very concerned that we've already, all these voters will, yeah. not get their, will not get their mail-in ballots. And by the way, Brian, you can't get mail in your ballot if it's not mailed out to you. And if you're not on the voter rolls, man, you ain't getting your ballot. And President Trump has alleged uh, mail-in ballots will result in huge fraud. There's been no evidence of that. How do you see that issue? Well, what I'm worried about is fraud against the voters. According to the—in in How Trump Stole 2020, I bring in the MIT Caltech study, which says 22 percent of all mail-in votes are never counted. That's one in five votes. How does that happen? About one in 10 votes, millions of votes— the voter doesn't get the ballot. You can't, again, you can't mail it in if it's not mailed out to you. So there's all kinds of reasons why those ballots don't get to you. But one in five ballots are not counted. And, and the other half of the missing ballots are those that are mailed in. About one in 10 mail-in ballots are disqualified. And Brian, it's for all kinds of cockamamie reasons. You know that 100,000 people lost their vote because of postage due in 2016? We had a quarter million people lose their vote because they didn't have the right signature. Someone said they didn't have the right signature. Uh, you used the wrong ballot. Stacey Abrams, who uh, I was working with in Georgia on uh, these voter purge systems, an African-American uh, you know, voting rights leader, and she almost lost her mail-in ballot because her ballot came to her in the primary with the return ballot in the Georgia humidity. The, the envelope was sealed. You break open that envelope, you've lost your vote. So these are the types of crazy things that happen with mail-in voting. It's not, it's not the voters who are committing fraud. The tricksters are the voting officials who are trying to make it difficult and tough and disqualify. I'm not sending you your ballot or disqualifying your ballot. Beware. And, and, but, Greg, for the record, have you seen anywhere any evidence of fraud involving uh voters who are committing fraud with mail-in ballots, selling their ballots or somehow playing around with it. I actually did a calculation, Brian, in the book. It's, and I found out, I calculated that the chance of your committing mail-in ballot fraud is one-fifth as likely as being hit by lightning. That's how rare it is. <laughs> We've been able to, um, from the Rutgers study, found that 12 people committed voter impersonation fraud in six years. That's out of several billion ballots cast. But we do know that literally millions of mail-in ballots have been lost because people didn't get them, et cetera. So the fraud is this teeny weeny, but the vote suppression, the fancy word for saying you didn't get your ballot or they don't count it, that's that big. Greg, we've already seen the long lines in the primaries across the country. Is this going to be repeated in the general election? Is that part of the plan, you think? Unfortunately, it is exactly part of the plan. That wasn't the mistake you saw in Georgia, in Kentucky, in Wisconsin. This is the fact that people were standing in line for hours. Do you think African Americans want to stand in line for hours in a human rain in Atlanta and get a virus that could kill them? No. They didn't get their ballots. 
And so you had you when we talked to the people in these lines, they requested absentee ballots. They didn't get them. That's one of the main reasons why people were in line in those long, terrible lines. Plus, with the virus, you can't get the you know we have older people run the polls. They can't get poll workers because it's just too dangerous for them to come in. So in Milwaukee, we went from 180 polling stations to five in a, in an African American city. <laughs> in you know in uh, Louisville, we went from about a couple hundred polling stations to one. This is going to be a disaster come November unless we prepare. Greg, let me ask you this. Is this an argument perhaps to uh, postpone the election, to delay it until the virus has passed somehow or there's a vaccine? I fear for democracy any delay I think is very dangerous. What we have to do is not delay the fix. We've got a problem. Let's fix it. Why are we, we shouldn't be purging anyone from voter rolls this year. No one should be losing their vote. We don't have any examples of of people of aliens coming from outer space. Um, you know, we don't have um, dead voters. We don't see zombies. We don't see ghost voters. And we don't see people voting 28 times. This doesn't happen. So let's stop purging voters. The second thing, as a voter, when you get that mail-in ballot, man, please look it over. In some states, you you know, in Alabama, you need a notarization of your ballot and, uh, or two witness signatures. Wisconsin, Minnesota, you need a witness signature. So I'm asking people, just be super careful with your ballot. Ask for it really early. Have someone check it over. And if it needs witness signatures, and we got crazy things. You know that in some states, you have to mail in photocopies of your ID. People miss this. And therefore, we've had about 3 million ballots, mail-in ballots lost or disqualified that was in 16. Multiply that by 10. We can't lose 30 million ballots, Brian. We got to fix this now. And I hope not to delay the election. Excuse me. I hope not to delay the election, but rather to fix it. All right, Greg Pellis, a terrific investigative reporting on this subject. Very much appreciated. Uh, your book is out today, How Trump Stole a 2020, The Hunt for America's Vanished Voters. Greg Pellis, thank you so much for joining us tonight. You're very welcome, Brian. Coming up, one of the positives from the COVID-19 pandemic, a huge drop in the crime rate. Is there a way to keep it down? We'll talk to a leading expert. You're watching the Law and Crime Trial Network. Back now to talk about crime and Rhonda Schwartz. One of the few positives that come out of the pandemic was a huge drop in the American crime rate. That's right, Brian. While we've seen a big increase in homicides, shootings in major cities over the last few weekends, a new study tracking crime in big cities since the start of the pandemic shows big decreases in other major categories of crime. I guess not really a surprise, and to get more insight, I talked earlier with Professor David Abrams at the University of Pennsylvania School of Law. Professor Abrams, thank you so much for joining us tonight. In the midst of a pandemic with demonstrations across the country for racial and social justice, your studies found an amazing fact about crime in this country. That's right, Brian. We found that crime has dropped uh, in response to the initial incidents of the pandemic. And pretty much every city we looked at, with a couple of exceptions, uh, and the drops were very substantial across most crime categories. Uh, the biggest one was drug crimes, where declines were about 60 percent in the cities where we had data. And do you think it's as simple as the fact that people were not going outside? I think that is one major component that has at least a couple effects, uh, that individuals are less likely to be targeted, especially for street crime, when there are fewer people on the street. Uh, but another piece is that they're less likely to report crime, and that's the data that we're looking at, is reports of crime. Of course, there's another factor, and that's uh, changes to policing. And definitely several major police departments made the decisions to reprioritize resources and especially to de-emphasize certain lower-level types of crime. So I think that's those factors put together explain a lot of the changes we saw in crime rates. 
Um, and again, most are declining with a couple notable exceptions. In the past few weekends, however, we've seen reports of extensive numbers of shootings in New York and Chicago and elsewhere. Does this fight uh, your conclusion? It doesn't for a couple reasons. Um, one is the time period we focused on for the study is mostly uh, ending around mid to end May. So the initial interest is to look at largely the pandemic effects on crime. But the second is actually, if we even think about the more recent periods going into June and July, a lot of times you see spikes, not just this year, but in uh, many years in the spring and summer, you see spikes in especially homicides and shootings and violent crimes. There's just an annual trend to those. It's very difficult to make very much of incidents that happen in one weekend or even a few weekend. You need more data. You need to look at a longer time horizon to be able to say something about uh, what may have caused those spikes. You're an economist by training as well as a professor uh, at the law school at the University of Pennsylvania. Uh, in New York, uh, Congresswoman Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, better known as AOC, offered her own explanation for what was in New York, a, a spike in crime. Listen to this and then tell me what you think of her explanation. So why is this uptick in crime happening? Well, let's think about it. Do we think this has to do with the fact that there's record unemployment in the United States right now? The fact that people are at a level of economic desperation that we have not seen since the Great Recession. Maybe this has to do with the fact that people aren't paying their rent and are scared to pay their rent. And so they go out and they need to feed their child and they don't have money. So you maybe have to, you're, they're put in a position where they feel like they either need to shoplift some bread or go hungry that night. Um, maybe it's the fact that unemployment provisions have not been given to everyone. Maybe it's because of the fact that people have, some people still haven't gotten their stimulus checks yet. So Professor Abrams, does that uh, make sense to you as an explanation? Well, I think AOC has put forward an intriguing hypothesis. That's how I, as an academic economist, would, would phrase that. And, but one that there's not enough data to corroborate yet. One weekend or even a few weekends doesn't tell us that. What we'd want to do to try to understand whether unemployment and poverty are the reasons behind some of the spikes in crime is get a longer amount of data. And we want to look uh, at individuals who experience unemployment and say, compare those with those who did not. That's the way you can get a more meaningful understanding of the real causes of crime. I'll just add, when we looked at the homicide data, that was actually one of the few, the homicide and the shooting data even earlier in the pandemic. Those were two categories that we actually did not see a decline in crime during this period, but we also didn't see an uptick as well. And again, it's because uh, it's hard to attribute changes unless you have a good amount of data. Also, one thing we noticed is that 2020 was a high homicide and shooting year even before the pandemic hit and well before uh, the protests and changes in unemployment. Um, so these things that look like they're happening now may be more exacerbated now, but that may be just due to uh, standard seasonality. We don't know yet whether it's because of some of these other causes. Based on what you've seen, do you think that drop in crime is about to go back up now that uh, there is uh, some reopening, at least in New York and the Northeast? I do, and we've already seen uh, that happen to some extent. Uh, if you look at the end of May and then into June at crime rates, uh, they have started going back up as people have started going back outside uh, and getting, I wouldn't say life is back to normal at all, but somewhat closer to normal. Uh, crime is also going closer to back to normal, uh, but it seems that crime rates are, for many categories, is, are pretty well associated with people being outside uh, and doing their regular routine. So as that continues, we'll see, we'll probably, I would expect we'd probably see uh, increases in crime, but to the extent we have additional lockdowns, my guess is, uh, and, and people concerned about uh, the pandemic uh, and staying home because of it, my guess is that will 
correspond with uh, uh, lowering in crime again. Can we draw from your data that policing matters less than outside circumstances in terms of the crime rate? I wouldn't say that. Policing certainly has an impact on the crime rate. And one of the possibilities that this, um, you know, this, the tragedy of the pandemic holds, though, is to increase our understanding of causes of and influences of crime uh, overall, and not just in this setting. That's one of the big goals I have for this research project, is to take uh, the circumstance where police change, individual behaviors change, surveillance change, incentives to commit crime change, and try to see, can we try to take those pieces apart a little bit and understand uh, better than we do now how much each of those impacts crime levels. Policing is certainly one of them, um, but we need to study this more carefully to try to uh, piece those apart. You also have taken a close look at calls for police reform and defunding the police with four suggestions that you have made, including uh, the union to stop protecting bad officers. Is that actually feasible, do you think? I hope it's feasible. Um, I will say one thing that gives me a little bit of uh, maybe justification for that hope is at least um, in the instance of the Floyd killing, there was not the immediate reaction uh, of police unions across the country to defend those officers. Uh, and that's something we've seen even in other particularly uh, egregious incidents of being caught on videotape. So that, by and large, I think with maybe minimal exception, didn't happen this time. Um, what I've heard from police unions makes me think that they are open to, uh, to more negotiation now and to more responsiveness to uh, what seems to be popular uh, popular requests these days for more accountability for police departments um, and uh, and policing that uh, accords better with what uh, what people in their cities uh, prefer. And can you tell us what you think would be the consequence of the so-called defunding movement in terms of the crime rate and uh, safety and security and, frankly, law and order, as some have called for? Sure. And the defunding movement, as I understand it, first of all, suffers from a major marketing problem. My understanding is most <laughs> uh, sane people who are calling for defunding the police don't want to get rid of the police completely and don't want to get rid of all their funding. I think they want substantial change to it. Uh, and I think that is a popular sentiment. Um, <clears throat> now, is this likely to happen? I hope so, and I think there is real scope for it happening. I know there's discussion, there are already bills been passed in a number of different cities aimed at partly is literally decreasing funding for police, but also uh, the possibility of assigning some of the police functions, for example, dealing with homeless people uh, to different parties and, and individuals with different types of training. Um, I think this is all, this all can be helpful, but I do think that just decreasing funding to the police without any alternative is not the way to go. There's pretty good evidence that police do decrease crime, and I don't think anyone wants crime to spike anywhere. And so the question is how to do, uh, how to make reforms that change policing so that we have, we don't have, say, unwarranted stops of individuals. We don't have racial disparities uh, in policing, but we do still have effective policing. And I think one important piece of that is having better individual accountability um, for officers, especially in supervisory roles. All right. Well, Professor David Abrams, thank you so much for fascinating insights from your data, which is really important in trying to figure out what's going on in the real world. Yeah, absolutely agree. And I can't emphasize that enough. I'm glad you, you mentioned it, because without data, we don't know what's going on at all. And there was just a story about the Chicago Police Department restricting access to arrest data in response to a story that wasn't popular with them. You know, 
I think that's just the wrong direction to go. And I think the more, you know, the more data, fortunately, most cities are moving in the direction of more data rather than less. And I think that's a great thing. All right, Professor Ravens, thank you again for being here tonight. Thanks so much. Coming up, this week's winners and losers in the media, as chosen by the editors of Mediaite, Tucker Carlson on the hot seat. You're watching the Law and Crime Trial Network. And we close out our program tonight with this week's winners and losers in the media. Joined, as always, by Aidan McLaughlin, who's the editor-in-chief of Mediaite, which, like the Law and Crime Trial Network, is part of the Dan Abrams media empire. And Aidan, CNN broke a big story over the weekend about the head writer at Tucker Carlson's program at Fox News. Lots came from that. Yeah, so this story got broken by CNN media reporter Oliver Darcy on Friday night. Uh, actually, uh, you know, uh, an hour or so before Tucker Carlson was going to go on air to do his primetime show on Fox News. And uh, it, it revealed that the head writer of Tucker Carlson's show, uh, who has been the head writer for the show for, for some a few years now, um, had been posting these racist and sexist comments, uh, pretty, pretty viciously racist and sexist comments, on an obscure messaging board uh, for years. Uh, now, you know, since then, uh, the writer resigned. Uh, Fox News had to issue a statement condemning uh, the comments made by the writer. And then just last night, Tucker Carlson actually addressed uh, the resignation on air and delivered, I wouldn't call it an apology, but he, he addressed the, uh, the resignation and the comments and at least gave his thoughts on it. I think we have video of that. First, what Blake wrote anonymously was wrong. We don't endorse those words. They have no connection to the show. It is wrong to attack people for qualities they cannot control. In this country, we judge people for what they do, not for how they were born. We often say that because we mean it. We'll continue to defend that principle, often alone among national news programs, because it is essential. Nothing is more important. Blake fell short of that standard, and he has paid a very heavy price for it. But we should also point out to the ghouls now beating their chests in triumph at the destruction of a young man that self-righteousness also has its costs. We are all human. When we pretend we are holy, we are lying. When we pose as blameless in order to hurt other people, we are committing the gravest sin of all, and we will be punished for it. There's no question. And Aiden, in Tucker Carlson's explanation of what his thoughts were, he didn't really go into what it was that Blake Neff, his, his writer, said on these sites, actually using an anonymous name, right? He used a different name than his own. Yes, he, it was under a pseudonym. And what I thought was pretty shocking about Tucker's comments there uh, is that he seemed to express more anger at uh, the reporting and the reaction to Blake Neff's uh, comments written on this uh, messaging board than the comments themselves, which were really, I should note, you know, I'm not going to repeat any of them here, but they were really viciously racist and sexist. Um, there was one uh, comment uh, sort of thread where he basically harassed a woman that he knew over Facebook for years, uh, with thousands of comments uh, directing harassment at this at this woman's looks uh, and other you know features, and, and that's aside from all the, the racist stuff that was posted here. Um, so the the idea that you know Fox News has to come out, they take the resignation of this lead writer, they issue a statement calling his behavior horrendous, calling the comments horrific, and then Tucker Carlson doesn't reveal to his audience what the nature of those comments were, and basically you know condemns the CNN for reporting on them. Uh, is, is fairly shocking, right. and uh, I'm sure it's not the sort of contrition that Fox News executives would have liked to have seen. And I think a larger question here is, is there evidence that what Blake Neff thought in person or personally on these sites worked its way into Tucker Carlson's broadcast on Fox News? Yeah, I, I think there's a lot of evidence of that. Uh, Oliver Darcy, the, again, the reporter who wrote the CNN story, actually uh, pointed out a couple of the similarities in the language between the stuff that he was posting on this messaging board and some of Tucker Carlson's monologues. Um, he also revealed Blake Neff in a, a, a piece, in an interview he did with the Dartmouth Review, uh, that he was uh, wrote the first draft for all of Tucker Carlson's monologues and a lot of the scripts that went up on the show. So he really was the lead writer. And, you know, Tucker Carlson has actually fended off uh, accusations of that his show is racist for years now. 
you know, he's done, he's gotten into hot water for uh, asking why diversity is inherently a good thing, uh, for saying that white nationalism, the idea that that is prevalent in the United States is a hoax. Uh, and whenever he gets accused of racism, he dismisses it and says that, you know, that's absurd, that's ridiculous. Uh, th- it makes it a lot harder for him to claim that his show is the ideas that his show promotes are not racist now, when we know that the person that was writing it was for years posting incredibly racist things on a messaging board. So I think a lot of the plausible deniability is is gone now for Tucker Carlson. Um, and that might explain why this week he's gone on vacation. Uh, he announced last night on his show uh, after he uh, issued those comments on, on Blake Knapp that he was going uh, on a, a pre-planned, he said, trip to go trout fishing this week, um, which the network says that has was always uh, on the cards. Um, but of course, it, it's not the first time that a Fox News host has gone on vacation after they've become mired in controversy. And we'll see if he comes back. Of course, Fox News as the number one uh, cable news network and Tucker Carlson with the number one show on that network uh, gets a lot of attention. Yeah. But so does another uh, anchor at uh, Fox News, Chris Wallace, who you called a winner for his take in his great interview last Sunday with the Secretary of Education, Betsy DeVos. Let's take a look at that. But, Secretary, I want to get I want to get to this issue uh, of, because this, the president of the United States said that the CDC guidelines were tough, expensive and impractical. I want to look at some of the other CDC guidance. They talked about putting up shielding uh, in places where six foot of six feet of distance is not possible. Plastic shielding. Uh, they talked about staggered uh, drop offs and pickups. Is that tough, expensive and impractical? So, Aiden, in your view and the view of your editors at Media, what made that a winning uh, interview? Sure. So, Betsy DeVos did a couple interviews this weekend on the Sunday shows. Um, but we really thought that Chris Wallace's interrogation of her was the best one. Um, he's, he's very, very good. Chris Wallace, he's the host of uh, Fox News Sunday. He's extremely good at holding officials' feet to the fire. I think that's what we tune in to watch him for. When you know, It doesn't matter whether it's a Trump official or you know an official in, in uh, you know New York government, uh, he's extremely good at interrogating uh, people in power and uh, you know trying to discern uh, whether or not either they're telling the truth or they're being fair or whatnot. And uh, his interview with Betsy DeVos was was really compelling. Uh, and he questioned her on President Donald Trump's comments about schools reopening in the fall and whether or not they passed muster. Um, a lot of which his comments about sort of the CDC guidelines about schools opening uh, were, were sort of absurd. And, you know, it's kind of hard to ask President Donald Trump about these things, especially when Trump hasn't granted Chris Wallace an interview in years. Uh, but the ability to be able to, to question Betsy DeVos on these on these uh, issues is a really important one. And he did a really good job of it. So from a broad perspective, does this speak well of the operation at Fox News, that they have all kinds of controversy going on with a wide range of views, it seems, or at least some range of views? You know, it, it's actually quite a tricky question for them. They often use uh, anchors like Chris Wallace, Shep Smith, when he was still at the network, uh, to point to the fact that they have real news people working for the network and that they have, you know, news bona fides. Uh, particularly, they they point to Chris Wallace whenever uh, one of their opinion hosts uh, becomes gets into controversy, whether it's for being too tight with the administration or uh, you know another issue. So, you know, they're often wielded as uh, sort of evidence that Fox News is a, is a very serious news network. And I think it's a, it's a, it's a strong argument. Um, I don't know if it convinces critics of Fox News. And 15 seconds here, Aiden. Uh, what does Fox News say when you call about uh, <clears throat> Mr. Carlson? Uh, I, 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 you know, he's the top rated host on Fox News. I, he's not going anywhere. I think we can confidently say. So you'll think he'll be back from his uh, trout fishing vacation, even with fewer advertisers. Yeah. yeah you know, I think advertisers yep. for a while have drifted away from his show. Fox News still makes a huge amount of money from it. Uh, he's replaced Sean Hannity, at least in the recent months, as the top rated host on Fox News. Um, so I think they're pretty confident right. that he's definitely going to come. All right. Aiden McLaughlin, thank you so much, as always. And thanks to the team here at Law & Crime for getting us on the air and off. Thank you.